Yu-Gi-Oh! is a game where both players start with 8,000 life points, and the objective of the game is to reduce your opponent's life points to zero. However, when it comes to competitive Yu-Gi-Oh!, that isn't necessarily the case, and most of the time, games can be won in a single turn. What's going on, guys? It's Simo. So today I'm bringing to you five ways that you can win a game of Yu-Gi-Oh! on turn one. There are a myriad of methods available to do this. It really all just depends on a particular competitive climate, but it's a great way to either impress your friends or maybe lose some in the process. Number one, combo decks. Combo decks are probably the most prevalent way that people win on turn one, and that's due to the fact that with a combination of cards, whether it's a one card, two card, maybe even three card combination, they can end on a end board that will result in numerous negations or potential lockouts that your opponent is going to be heavily restricted in how they play the game. Take for instance, Ad Emancipator. Ad Emancipator is able to amass numerous negations on its turn one board, as well as static shutdown effects like Abyss Dweller for the Graveyard, Dragon Buster Destruction Sword for the extra deck. We'll talk about those a little bit more in depth later on. But when you look at a board that Ad Emancipator is able to assemble, and it's not like it's just a one-off, the Ad Emancipator can do this fairly frequently and with relative ease, even through multiple disruptions, there's no question that a deck like this is not only going to be at the top tiers of competitive play, but also a reason why a lot of people flock to it is because it wins the game with only having to play play a single turn. A lot of the top players believe that the best decks are the best decks because they're able to do the most unfair things and they can do the most unfair things in the least amount of turns. The less turns you have to play, the less likely things are to go wrong. And it also gives you more time to play your other games in a particular match and focus on those if they do end up going longer. And so it's no surprise that you see players flocking to combo decks because players enjoy performing a 142 step combo that ultimately results in them winning the game without actually winning the game, but it basically is going to force a concession, which is the same result. And Ad Emancipator is just one example. You can trace Yu-Gi-Oh's history and identify combo deck after combo deck, albeit these boards do look different from one another, they ultimately end in the same goal, and that is winning in a singular turn. Number two, Lingering Effects. Now, I alluded to this a little bit earlier when it came to the Ad Emancipator end board, but Abyss Dweller was the card I was referring to. A lingering effect for the those who don't know is an effect that even if the monster does leave the field, that that effect will linger throughout the duration of the turn. So for instance, with a card like Abyss Dweller, even if you remove the Abyss Dweller from the field, the opponent is going to be locked from the graveyard for the duration of the turn. This is particularly devastating for any graveyard focused strategy because if they're unable to access their graveyard for a turn, they're not going to be able to put up much of a fight. And most likely with the power level that Yu-Gi-Oh has, they're just going to get OTK'd on the following turn. Some other more oppressive examples of this are cards like True King of All Calamities. True King of All Calamities, albeit it is a little bit more difficult to summon being a rank 9 Xyz monster, basically makes it so that as soon as it hits the board, the opponent is not going to be having any fun because the effects of all monsters of whatever type is declared are going to be negated, and it really isn't fun for anyone to deal with. Then, on the following turn, once the opponent does absolutely nothing, because that's typically the situation you're put in when you're staring down a True King of All Calamities, then they're going to go ahead and just switch everything vertical and attack you directly. Another more prominent example of this is Utopic Zexel being summoned off of the brand new Numeron network released in Battles of Legend Armageddon. From a single card, you are able to summon a monster that pretty much prevents your opponent from doing anything for the duration of their turn. And then on their following turn, they're free to do whatever they want and either they're going to lock up the game to the point where you have no way of coming back or they're just going to kill you by OTKing you. These cards are so oppressive because even if you do remove the threat from the field, the lingering effect is still going to be active and you're going to be encumbered by that ability. And so your options are fairly limited. So you're having to play just any sort of defense you can, hoping that you can survive until your next turn. But there's a reason these cards are played and that's because they win the game on turn one. Number three. Floodgates. Now, Floodgates is a very broad term, but essentially it is any card that prevents the opponent from being able to play the game. This is similar to Lingering Effects, but I would say the big difference between a Floodgate and a Lingering Effect is if you remove the Floodgate from the field, then the effect is no longer active. These cards are still very powerful, but they aren't as powerful as Lingering Effects because they're not going to last the duration of the turn, even if they get removed from the field. Some Floodgates in particular that I want to discuss are 
cards like Dragon Buster Destruction Sword. Again, this is another card that we mentioned in the combo deck portion of this video. And Dragon Buster Destruction Sword being able to lock your opponent out of special summoning from the extra deck is just a silver bullet. If your deck relies on the extra deck in any sort of capacity, this card can just win the game on its own. And thanks to a card like Union Carrier, it is accessible to any deck that can easily summon Dark or Dragon Monsters. Another instance of this is El Shadal Winda. A lot of the times when an El Shadal Winda hits the field, if it's going up against a deck that heavily relies on special summoning, if you only get a single special summoning thanks to El Shadal Winda being face up, then it's just game over. There's not much you can do and you're just going to scoop it up and go to game two. If your deck is heavily spell focused, cards like Imperial Order and Anti-Spell Fragrance can be your ultimate demise because these are the ultimate backbreaking cards when it comes to any spell oriented deck. And Sky Striker and Pendulum players can tell you that if they see either of those, it is going to be game over. Depending on the strategy, these cards will see play in the side deck and sometimes the main deck. And depending on the climate of any particular metagame, if these cards hit the field, that player is going to win solely based off of the back of that floodgate alone. And those types of cards can easily prompt concessions from the opponent. They may seem rather innocuous, but floodgates are a very easy way to win on turn one. Number four, Towers cards. The term Towers derives from the Apocalyphort Towers that saw play during the Duelist Alliance era in the Cleave Fort strategy. And this is a card that was immune to all other card effects at the time. And basically, if it hit the field, would prompt a concession from the opponent because there wasn't any way to actually clear it. In my opinion, this is a very poor card design because there should never be a card that doesn't have a way to combat it. And yeah, there were cards that could actually do something against a card like this, but the outs to a card like a Apocalyphort Towers were few and far between and required you to hard draw them from the top of your deck. There are numerous examples of Towers cards throughout Yu-Gi-Oh's history. Masterpiece, the true Draco Slaying King is a very prominent one, albeit it's only immune to two thirds of the card pool being monster, spell, or trap. When it comes to competitive Yu-Gi-Oh, most of it is consumed with monsters and spell cards. So a monster spell immune masterpiece basically would be impervious to almost everything. Raid Raptor Ultimate Falcon is another one. Blackwing Full Armor Master. There's also in Infinitrack Fortress Megaclops, and albeit Infinitrack Fortress Megaclops is only immune to monster effects specifically, contextually, this can be enough. Because if a particular metagame is comprised of almost entirely monster effects, especially when it comes to removal, then being able to stick a monster like Megaclops onto the field is a win condition in and of itself. If your opponent has no way to out it, then you basically just win the game off the back of Megaclops alone. A lot of people don't really like this strategy because it kind of is a bit all in and if that towers card does get toppled in some way or another usually due to a card like a kaiju then your entire win condition falls in shambles however it is still good enough that it has been the central focal point of so many different strategies in the past and sometimes sees a side deck roll for some players looking to cheese out some easy wins and so for those reasons towers cards are a very easy way to win a game on turn one and that's going to bring us to my fifth and final way to win a game of Yu-Gi-Oh on turn one, and that is Mystic Mine. Why go through all the effort of performing a 176 step combo to end on a 10 negate board, or go through the effort of committing all your resources into a towers monster that's ultimately just going to get kaiju when you can just let your opponent play out their turn, drop Mystic Mine, and just win the game on the spot. Mystic Mine is just the embodiment of terrible card design, but a lot of players view it as a powerful equalizer because because it helps combat some of these other strategies. As soon as Mystic Mine hits the field, the player who controls more monsters can no longer activate any sort of monster effects, and this typically results in a dynamic where the player who controls Mystic Mine is trying to deck out the opponent because if they do not have an out to Mystic Mine in the form of spell or trap removal specifically, because remember, monster effects don't work, then they're just going to deck out because most likely during their turn one, they've searched their deck a few times and their deck count is going to be lower than their opponent and so they would reach the end of their deck quicker, and most people will just concede at the sight of a single Mystic Mine. Mystic Mine's release has just forced this incredible dynamic when it comes to the side decks for games two and three, because if we're in any particular metagame and players know that they're going to be siding Mystic Mine against one another, they need to have removal for it. If they don't have removal for it and their player does play the Mystic Mine, then it's just game over immediately once that Mystic Mine resolves. I also just love seeing players who do play 
by Mystic Mind, throwing every other card they have at their opponent's board, hoping that it gets negated because that way the opponent will waste all their negations. They can slap Mystic Mind down as their last card and they just automatically win the game. You know, people may hate a card like Mystic Mind, but there's a reason I saved it for last. This is the easiest way to win games of Yu-Gi-Oh you have ever witnessed. And if your opponent doesn't have spell and trap removal in the form of spell and trap cards, then they are going to be in for a world of misery. And so with that said, it's no surprise that Mystic Mine is the easiest way to win a game of Yu-Gi-Oh on turn one. So guys, that's going to wrap up the video. Let me know down in the comments what you guys think. I'd really love to hear your thoughts. Thank you guys so much for watching the video. Be sure to like the video as always. Subscribe to the channel for more amazing Yu-Gi-Oh content. And if you found this video helpful, consider supporting me on Patreon or becoming a YouTube channel member. Just by showing your support in any way that you can, you're investing in my ability to continue bringing you amazing Yu-Gi-Oh content. So thanks so much again, and we'll see you next time.